Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum and good afternoon from Glasgow, Scotland's largest city. I am Shai the uh, Chief Operating Officer here um, from uh, Colourful Heritage. It gives me uh, great pleasure to kick off the, the first panel of the uh, MacFest 2022 festival. This is the first time uh, Colourful Heritage have been asked to participate in this uh, fantastic event and uh, it truly looks like a packed itinerary uh, stretching over several weeks and it generally looks like a global festival celebrating Muslim culture and Muslim uh, arts and identity. Colourful Heritage are based in Scotland in Glasgow uh, in uh, the UK's third largest city and uh, we have uh, we basically our, our, our ethos is centered around three words capture celebrate and inspire. By capture, we mean we, uh, we're creating the largest archive of uh, oral histories of South Asian immigrants and Muslims uh, to Scotland. Uh, we celebrate the contribution and sacrifices uh, of these early pioneers. And we hope to finally inspire future generations to build a more caring and cohesive society. So a little bit about uh, Colourful Heritage, uh, a bit about our background. We have we set out 10 years ago, uh, just over 10, year, 10 years ago, to amass the oral narratives, uh, the stories of early uh, Muslim and South Asian immigrants uh, to Scotland. And to this end, we created a digital timeline of events stretching over several decades up to the present. And in doing so, we have created over a hundred uh, oral videos. Uh, we have working closely with our stakeholder, the Glasgow Museums. We've created a public exhibition with our stakeholder. And we have also created educational resource packs, which we deliver uh, digitally uh, to primary schools and um, exploring the, uh, uh, the uh, and documenting the um, the, uh, the contribution of these early migrants. Uh, initially, when they came over in the 40s and 50s, they were applying their trade as peddlers, uh, for example, door-to-door -door salesmen. And um, we've also basically uh, uh, put together their contribution to the civic life, the political life, the business life, not only by the Muslims, but also by the Hindus and the Sikhs. And we've also basically uh, collated the historical accounts of the British Indian Army, which was made up of Muslims, Sikhs and Hindus in the True Gate Wars. So this is what we've uh, done over the last 10 years. And um, we've now basically reached a situation where we are uh, actively involved within the community. Our chief guest speaker today, uh, kicking off the panel, uh, is Duncan Dornan. 
Uh, Duncan was appointed head of museums and collections for Glasgow Life in 2015, having joined the company in 2013 as a senior museums manager. Uh, prior to this, he had worked uh, with the National Museums of Scotland um, since 1999 as a museum manager. Uh, within Glasgow Life, his role evolves around the responsibility for the management and development of Glasgow's eight world-class museums, along with the innovative Glasgow Museums Resources Centre. He's also responsible for the city's collections covering archaeology, natural history, technology, fine and decorative arts, social history, and the special collections in the Mitchell Library and the City Archives. I'll now pass over the panel to Duncan Dorman. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to speak to you this afternoon and, 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 and delighted to have been asked um, and to talk a little about uh, our relationship with colourful history and the, and the outputs we've achieved over the, the duration of that relationship. Um, a key date for us is, is 2014. At that time, uh, Colourful Heritage had successfully established the Bashir Mine Archive uh, and we're looking for a permanent home to locate the archive and secure it for the future. Uh, despite uh, some fairly stiff competition from the National Museums in Edinburgh, we were fortunately able to secure it uh, and locate it in the Glasgow City Archive in the Mitchell Library. Um, we were delighted to be able to do this because the, the archive uh, provides uh, uh, the history of Glasgow, a very comprehensive history of Glasgow uh, from the Middle Ages through to the present day. It's one of the largest city archives in, in the UK. And the uh, South Asian community in Glasgow are, are, are both a, a large, uh, successful and influential part of our, our community. And it, we felt very important uh, that this story was represented in the archive and continues to evolve within our archive. Uh, so those conversations were successful and we were able to secure the archive, which continues to develop in the Mitchell to this day. However, in discussion with Colourful Heritage, uh, we were able to establish both that Colourful Heritage aspired to, 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 to much more than the archive. Uh, and at the same time, Glasgow Museums were, were particularly conscious of the fact that the demographics of our audience did not match those of the city. And that in particular, the South Asian community was under underrepresented in, in the people visiting our museum. Uh, Colourful Heritage undertook a, a, a review of, of the offer in our museums to, to try to identify some of the issues within the, the museum institutions. And uh, one of the outputs from this was that we identified we needed to create more content within museums, which reflected the experience of, of the, the South Asian diaspora and particularly told the, the, the story of this first generation arriving in Glasgow, which was uh, the, the subject, obviously, of the Bashir Mine Archive. So this led to the creation of the Glaswegian Asians exhibition in Scotland School. Uh, this was a co-curated exhibition. Uh, we held sessions to uh, explore the stories which the, the community wanted to see displayed. Uh, we developed the content with uh, members of the community and many of the objects on display in the exhibitions were loaned from individuals in the community. And this was a, an exciting opportunity to allow this, this, uh, the, the, these interesting uh, and revealing stories to be told in the words of the people who'd actually experienced this. Uh, one of the other key issues that came out through the Glaswegian Asians exhibition was the, the underrepresentation of the role that, that uh, people from India and Pakistan had played in both world wars. Uh, and uh, we were delighted when, uh, as a consequence of this exhibition and work, other work done by Colourful Heritage, a wreath was finally laid to the British Indian Army at the Cenotaph in Glasgow, marking that, that massive contribution. Um, the Glaswegian Asian exhibition attracted uh, significant critical praise, uh, a great deal of, of interest, uh, and we had many high profile visits to, to Scotland Street during the, the run of the exhibition, uh, and was helpful in significantly changing our audience. So it really started to redress that imbalance we had in, in the attendance in museums uh, and to raise the profile of, of, of the community within, within Glasgow. Um, the exhibition had proved very successful in Scotland Street. We're now uh, working on a revised version of it, which will be on display in one of our uh, other museums. We're, we're developing that for the People's Palace. Uh, and this is a stepping stone on, on, onto more widespread representation of the community across all of our museums. Uh, but we feel in the museum service a very successful stepping stone. Uh, and we're very grateful to the, the hard work um, uh, and the creativity of Colourful Heritage uh, in developing this and, and making it such a success. Um, Glaswegian Asians uh, was a, a mainstream provision in our, one of our museums, but we then moved on from this to develop more bespoke material uh, aimed at the school's uh, contingency. 
Glasgow Museums is a very successful schools programme. Around 97% of children in Glasgow attend a, a programme offered by Glasgow Museums. So we're very pleased to be able to work with Colourful Heritage, who, who proved to be a, an excellent and, and very creative partner, to develop five primary school resource packs. Uh, these packs cover the, the role of the British Indian Army in World War I, uh, the Army in World War II, uh, along with information on Force K6, uh, which was a significant presence in Scotland during World War II, uh, a pack on uh, South Asian entrepreneurs in, Glas in Scotland, uh, a pack on political and civic contributions, and a pack on um, migration and cultural identity. These parks are extremely viable, both in, in, in raising awareness of the, the South Asian community, uh, creating um, a, a greater sense of uh, connection, uh, particularly for people outside the community, into the community, and also in um, influencing our school children to see Glasgow as the, as the successful uh, and uh, diverse city which it is. Um, so the relationship with, with Colourful Heritage has, has worked extremely well for us as an organisation. Um, their influence has been very positive uh, and we believe there's, there's still a very strong future for us in, in expanding this work and really changing how we collect, how we display uh, and really, really building relationships for the museum service uh, into all areas of the community. Um, I'm very happy now to pass on to the next speaker. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, thank you very much, uh, Duncan, for those informative few minutes uh, highlighting the special relationship uh, and indeed the considerable outputs that Glasgow Museums and uh, Club of Heritage have managed to professionally execute over the past uh, several years. Okay, now it's for uh, the next uh, 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 colleague of mine on the panel um, is uh, Dr. Saka Bazak, uh, armed with a doctoral degree in uh, chemistry, organic chemistry from uh, St. Andrews University. Um, Saqib uh, was appointed as chief researcher at Colourful Heritage using her research and analytical skills to trace the roots of early South Asian settlers to Scotland. Uh, she has uh, conducted oral videos uh, of uh, South Asian immigrants and some of her elders uh, in creating the digital archive, uh, has helped write a, helped write a chapter called Feeling Scottish Being Muslim in a book titled Scotland's Mus Muslims, Society, Politics and Identity, helped set up the first of its kind historical South Asian exhibition, uh, as Duncan pointed out, the Glaswegians uh, exhibition at Scotland Street Museum, and uh, was uh, instrumental in developing the educational resource packs, which again Duncan highlighted there, uh, working in conjunction very closely with the Glasgow Museums. So I would now like to hand over to my colleague uh, Sakib for her presentation. Our presentation will take two parts. The first part will look at um, the contribution of Scotland's Muslims. And in the second part of the presentation, the, uh, the immense contribution of the British Indian Army uh, in the two great wars, uh, the uh, First World War and the Second World War. So I now hand over to uh, Sakib Rizak. Assalamualaikum. Good morning, good evening. Good afternoon, no matter where you are in the world. I, 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 I'm sure there's many people from all over that are joining in for today's uh, talk. I just want to thank uh, Brother Shahid and also Duncan Dorner from Glasgow Museums for their uh, introduction and for their talks, just kind of highlighting, giving you a flavour of uh, what Colourful Heritage is about uh, just before I start my talk. I'd also like to thank Gesra as well for her um, invitation and also you know, the opening ceremony this morning was fantastic. There was lots of events, really an eye opener and you know, hats off to her for pulling off what will be um, quite a colorful year, I think, you know, with nearly 75 events. So if you can just bear with me while I share my screen and pull up my slides for my talk. Okay, I think everybody can see that. So as Brother Shahid said, my talk today is about the contribution of Scotland's Muslims and the story of Force K6, and it will be in two parts. There'll be a question and answer session, uh, which you can add in your questions into the chat box after part one. So this will be about a half an hour talk and lots of slides. And then we'll move on to part two, which will be about the British Indian, the British Indo-Pak Army, sorry, 
and the connection of Force K6 with Scotland. So please type in any questions you have that come to your mind during the talk, just type them into the, the chat box, which I have for later. Okay, I guess the reason for this presentation is to celebrate and to inspire others, you know, to let other people know of the amazing achievements that the South Asian community have made within Scotland, uh, particularly our South Asian and Muslim elders. Now, as you know, uh, many of you may, may know or may not know, in fact, that colourful heritage document the stories of not just the Muslims in Scotland, but in fact, the South Asian community as a whole. So we capture stories of the Sikh community, the Hindu community, and obviously, you know, of course, the, the Christian South Asian community as well, as well as the Pakistani and non-Pakistani Muslims. So and I guess this is just to highlight the very unique story that Scotland itself has, and it's very unique heritage story. And I hope you're able to learn and pass on some of this information to youngsters or to other people in other organizations. Um, you know, we want people to know this story so that, you know, they, they feel proud of their heritage and identity. So before I go on, I want to just highlight a couple of resources that Colourful Heritage have created. Uh, you, know, you saw from that promo video, we and also Shahid mentioned as well, we've got up to date now over 120 very unique and amazing oral video histories of people from our community. And this is just a selection of a few. And you can see it's from both men and women from a variety of faiths that have come on and given their first-hand accounts and talked about um, you know, stories such as partition, India-Pakistan partition. They've talked about their own personal migration to Scotland. How did they find work here? How did they find um, you know, coping with family life? And then eventually settling in Scotland today. And many of these stories are in English. Of course, there are a few that are also in Urdu and Punjabi that have been translated on YouTube. So this should make it accessible for everyone to, to follow and to watch. And there's a website there, colorfulheritage.com, and you can go to the video section. Okay, so that was one of the resources. Uh, this is a book that Shahid had mentioned. It's a book that we published a chapter in called, it's a book called Scotland's Muslims, Society, Politics and Identity by Edinburgh University. And the chapter's called Feeling Scottish and Being Muslim. And this actually is a chapter which is based upon identity of the Scottish Muslim diaspora and how from our interviews we gathered, you know, uh, data to, to relate as to what the Scottish identity um, is, you know, what, what identity the, the Scottish Muslims feel presently. You know, many of them gave um, amazing answers, you know, such as being Scottish Muslims, Scottish Pakistani Muslims, so they, they weren't able to give just the one kind of identity answer, but also there's a, a little bit of background as to why this sentiment is so strongly felt within the, the Muslim community. So if you get a chance, you know, do have a look at this chapter within this book. It, the, the, the book itself actually charts the lives and times of Scotland's Muslims living in contemporary Scotland. So do take a look. Okay, one of our other recent uh, resources that we've made uh, last year was called Explore Heritage. And this consists of Explore Scotland, which um, is a, a, an interactive map that you can actually see on your screen and click on a different area and it should be able to take you to some information about heritage, South Asian or Muslim heritage within that area. So for example, you can see there is something in um, Orkney, you can see something in Glencarran Estate, there is also something in Laird. So there's you know, all sorts of uh, places in Scotland. And of course, you know, if anybody has any other items, then do write into us and let us know. And this is on our website as well. We've also got Explore Glasgow, which is a uh, different areas. It's split into museums, space buildings, football, and um, restaurants. So anywhere where there's kind of South Asian heritage, you should be able to click on these and see what, what, what the heritage is as well. Okay, so when did it all start? So South Asians have been connected with Scotland for a very long time. And I put down here, even before 1855, which was actually news to me when I first started on this project about four or five years ago, because I, you know, I always thought people came here 
around about 1960s and, you know, 1950s, 60s, and that was it. But, you know, I was really surprised to know this. And I guess they've got a very long connection in terms of, you know, they were Indian servants. So India being part of Pakistan, India, Pakistan at the time together, there were Indian servants. There were also the Lashkar, the seamen that came employed on British ships as sort of cheap labor at the time. There were also ayahs and ummas that acted as nannies for the children of Scottish families. And this was even before 1855. However, in 1855, we have the first confirmed person uh, known as Maharaja Dilip Singh. So, like I said, my, my talk will be, it will cover mostly Muslims, but there will be, I'll pepper in a couple of other um, people from other faiths as well. So what we've done is we've created a digital timeline on our website. This is our one of our other resources as well. And you can see in 1855, we have Maharaja Dilip Singh from Lahore, who was um, deposed to the Grand Tully estate in Perthshire. So he actually came and stayed in Scotland. And there's his, his heritage is also um, in Menzi, Castle Menzies in Stirling as well. I believe one of his first children uh, is buried within uh, one of the churches near Stirling as well. So there's quite a lot of heritage. We've also got, you know, the Lashkars coming in about 1860. The timeline will show you that there's uh, peddlers that started to come round about the late 1800s, early 1900s. This is an extract from a registrar, registrar, a register from Mitchell Library, which has got names of some of these peddlers when they registered for their licenses. And then, of course, we've also got, you know, the story of um, Lady Zenob Kobold, who was the first British Muslim who travelled to Mecca for Hajj in 1933. So she converted to Islam and her estate is in Glencarran estate within the Highlands. Now we've also got, you know, clips, little nuggets of information about, for example, the first um, Celtic football player called Muhammad Salim, also known as Twinkle Toes, who arrived in, in Glasgow and played for Celtic in 1936. So the timeline goes all the way up to 2021. So there's the address there, do check it out for sort of little nuggets of information. Okay. So I wanted to talk to you now a little bit about some of the pioneering peddlers, Punjabi peddlers in Scotland. And of course, for those of you that don't know what a peddler is, that is somebody who is a door-to-door -door salesman. So usually they take a large suitcase and they go around door to door selling household items. This is probably one of the first jobs that the South Asian community did when they first arrived in Scotland. Many of them came from the Punjab region to, to Glasgow. And these Punjabi peddlers created their own jobs. So they weren't competing for jobs with other people. They made their own kind of work. So they weren't working in factories. It was, you know, self-employment. And many of them went on to become, you know, um, entrepreneurs and open up big, bigger businesses and other, other types of businesses, franchise out into different types of businesses. So the information in my presentation is an amalgamation from Uncle Bashir Mann, who you can see on the right here, his, his books, he's got three books out. And also from the interviews of people that I personally interviewed myself and within the Colourful Heritage Archive. In fact, there are just too many people to mention. So I've just taken a select few for today just to highlight their story. And I'll try and highlight if their children have given any interviews on the way as well along, as we go along. So one of the first people that, that I know of that has come to Glasgow, that's come to my attention, is this gentleman here called uh, Noor Muhammad Dunda, who arrived in Glasgow in 1916. And that's the only picture that I have of him. He opened a, a warehouse with uh, Mr. Atta Ashraf, who arrived in 1926. And both of them together had this warehouse in the Gorbals, which I'll go on to talk about next. But just to give you a quick flavour, we've also got uh, Mr. Yaqub Ali, who was the owner of Castle Cash and Carry, one of the largest castle, uh, cash and carries in Europe. He arrived in 1952 and was a best friend of uh, Uncle Bashir Mann, who arrived a year later. And I'll talk about both of these men a little bit later on in my talk. So this picture here you see is from outside Dunda and Ashraf Warehouse in the Gorbals, 1953. And you can see that there's a group of peddlers. So there's a group of these men 
very nicely, very smartly dressed um, in sort of British clothing, standing outside look, waiting to see somebody off who's going by road to India or to Pakistan. And we've got an interview of Mr. Atta Ashraf's grandson, Zahid Ashraf, in our archive, if you want to hear it. He goes into more detail about this, you know, um, about this warehouse. Essentially, the warehouse itself was a hub for um, all the peddlers to gather. And it was somewhere where they all gathered together at four o'clock and, you know, they would have their tea, they would socialize, they would play cards. And Mr. Ashraf's wife and family lived upstairs from this warehouse. So upstairs there was a tenement. And so his wife was sent down tea at four o'clock. So this was like a main hub, um, a meeting point. And this is where they would share their sort of day-to-day -day peddling experiences, you know, how did it go, what sold, what didn't, what area was good, you know, anything they learned, any tips, and also get advice on housing matters as well. And very often Mr. Ashraf and Mr. Dunder would give the peddlers items or um, in good faith and, and sort of goodwill. And we would not take payment for them at the time until they'd actually sold them and got the money. So essentially this place was acting as a mini bank for this early startup of the community. And obviously as a, as a hub as well, because at that point there was no mosque. Um, earlier on when this had started, there was a mosque, but it was just beginning to, um, they, they just started to, to make, to, to have the mosque converted and there was building works going on inside it. So this was a main point for them. It's really interesting to see that these people are wearing very outwardly clothes, very smartly dressed with the trench coats and their hats. So they were very much integrated, you can see in this picture, very much trying to integrate and to try and fit in. So they adopted the way of um, Britain by wearing these kind of outwardly, um, outwardly dressed in these kind of clothes. So a couple of other people I wanted to mention was Haji Shir Muhammad, who arrived in 1936. And he's the owner of the, the Shear Brothers Empire in Glasgow. And even today, they, they still have um, the House of Shear um, Plaza, I would call it, you know, with lots of shops inside it. So it's still very much in the running in Glasgow, part of Glasgow's fabric. And we've got uh, somebody called Mr. Nehar Singh Rakra, who arrived in 1947. I've got his interview recorded in the archive. And he actually is one of the oldest entrepreneurs. He's about 95. And up to two years ago, he was still going into his office. So that was a really interesting story from him to find out about Glasgow. And of course, we've also got Mohammed Pufail, Sh Pufail Shaheen, who is the owner of Shaheen Kashinkari, and he's also the founder of Glasgow, the Caring City. And he also helped out quite a lot with the future planning and building of Glasgow Central Mall. So these are quite important people within um, the foundation of Glasgow. And just to show you, these are some of their shops. So this is the Share Brothers shops in 1973 in Gorbals. A lot of this has all been knocked down now because of new development there with the Sheriff Court. And we've also got Shaheen Cash and Carry there at the corner as well in Norfolk Street. So these are the early starts of their businesses. So they've gone on from warehouses to smaller shops. So the next person I wanted to highlight was a Mr. Nawab Dean who arrived in Glasgow in 1954. And again, you know, arrived with hardly any money, but had a vision, had a, had a passion to do something. And he married somebody called Darcy Dean, and both of them, sorry, Darcy, and both of them, Mr. and Mrs. Dean together, built their, um, the, the Dean Cash, the D&D &D Cash and Carry brand. So originally it was based within the Gorbals, within a converted building, but he had a vision and eventually went on to build Glasgow's first purpose-built cash and carry. Now he arrived himself from Chichavatni, just in the district of Sahiwal, and he wasn't able to speak much English at all, but yet because he was so passionate, he decided, and he was very good in business terms, that he was able to then you know, start up his business. And he was also a peddler. And when he built this, this particular cash and carry, which still stands in Glasgow, known as ABS cash and carry now. He wanted to improve the customer experience and he also wanted to introduce proper parking, proper till points, because many of these buildings were in small, tight, um, unsafe, um, many of these businesses were in very small, unsafe, uh, tight buildings. So this was the first time that somebody had built this in 1982. 
but it also provided a lot of storage space for goods. And it was quite a big deal at the time. You know, a lot of people um, uh, visited this and it was a different customer experience. So a year later, Mr. Yakub Ali, who I've already mentioned before, who'd also arrived with very few money, uh, very few money in his pocket, built Castle Cash and Carry. I don't have a picture of that. So if anybody does have one, do send it in to me. He went on to build the Europe's largest Castle Cash and Carry in the Gorbals. And eventually he was also involved a lot in the mosque committee in planning for the central mosque. He donated a very large sum of nearly half a million pounds to Strathclyde University and eventually went on to receive an OBE for his services. So this is all from humble beginnings of being um, a peddler. So this is quite an interesting picture I thought I'd put in. It's a picture in Glasgow Museum's collections. It has, it shows a really brightly coloured uh, shop front which we believe it may be either in, in Gorbals or near sort of the Cathcart Road end of Glasgow. And it's called Nemeth Gada, which means the Blessed One. So having worked as peddlers or even in fact in the buses, which we'll talk about later as well, many of the South Asian community picked up language skills. So they were able to then, you know, open up their own businesses. And you can see this is amazing that it's got writing in English, but also very much in Urdu language. I mean, this is probably one of the first Mutai shops, sweet meat shop, like a carrier restaurant type of um, shop at the time. Very brightly coloured. So if anybody has any information on that as well, do get in touch and let me know. But I thought that was a nice one to just add in. So many of the ladies also went on to become entrepreneurs as well. And they would start off their businesses at home, sewing clothes eventually, you know, contributing to the family expenses. Um, earning money, they would have loose cloth at home in certain some rooms, so they'd be selling the, the, the loose material. But many of them went on and uh, opened up, you know, sort of smaller businesses. And this is one example of somebody from Edinburgh, and this is Shaheen Yunus, CBE. She worked in a restaurant and got experience. Um, and she arrived a, a bit later on in 1967. But having built up that experience, she went on to open her first restaurant in Edinburgh. I believe it was called Nadia's. And then by 1998, she's got Mrs. Yunus Spice Foods Limited uh, all started up. And she had a vision of helping other Asian women that were at home to try and get them out into the factory to try and help her. And by 2016, a lot of her products, you know, you probably know her from the products in Asda. She sells the, um, she's got pakoras, Mrs. Yunus Nans, all sorts of brands of food. So that's one of the, the bigger entrepreneurs in Glasgow, uh, sorry, in Edinburgh. And of course, one of the UK's most popular dishes, in fact, was invented at Shish Mahal restaurant in the West End. The dish itself was cre created by Mr. Ali Ahmed. That's in there on the left, standing outside in the 1970s. And you can see there's a big queue of people queuing to get into this restaurant. And that's what the dish looks like. And so, so it goes that he made, he made a dish sent it out to a customer, it was too dry, and he came back and he added some gravy to it, uh, from apparently from a, a, a tin of condensed soup, tomato soup. So that's what the story goes like. So that's some of the inventions. Now if I move on to the fact that Glasgow Transport Corporation heavily relied on South Asian the South Asian uh, community during especially the 1960s and the 1970s and they played a vital role in keeping the transport system going at that point and the reason they, they worked here was because you know it, they, they learned so many skills they learned driving skills they were made aware of different areas within within Glasgow within Edinburgh within Dundee and they were able to get overtime so they worked very, very long hours. Now this picture, in fact, is uh, an image of my grandfather from, from Feslabad. And that's the back of the image there as well, in which you know um, his son has written that he refused himself all the comforts and always in these black clothes because they worked their normal shift hours, then they worked overtime. So they worked many hours in a day working hard. And very often they came here without the families, maybe one, one or two children and that's it. But the families would be back home in India or Pakistan. 
So they supported not just themselves, but their families as well. Um, and this gave them, a, like I said, gave them a lot of skills. And many of them started off as bus conductors, as drivers. And then of course, some of them, very few of them went on to being bus inspectors. So we actually have a video of this gentleman here, Muhammad Udin. We have his video telling his story. And in fact, his story is also uh, within the Riverside Museum in one of the films there as well. We managed to get his outfit as a bus, as a bus inspector. And this was on display at the Glaswegian Asians exhibition along with a couple of other items as well. You can see there's a suitcase for peddlers as well. He himself was a bank manager in Pakistan, but fell in love with Scotland when he came to visit and decided to stay here. And to this day, he still stays within the Pollock Shales area and really enjoyed working on the buses and making you know, his way up and opening up his other businesses later on. So a couple of other little stories. This is of Dr. Ibrahim Ashraf, who was the um, pretty much, I would say, the first South Asian person in Scotland to be awarded an MBE medal and possibly even in the whole of UK. He's the son of Mr. Atta Ashraf, who had the warehouse. Now, he came here as a child. He's probably one of the first children that came to Glasgow at the age of about, I would say, 10, 11, and enrolled in Allen Glen School, just used to be near Strathclyde University. And he then went back to Pakistan, was there at um, Agricultural University, uh, and then after partition decided to come back to Britain. And in 1948, he enrolled for a PhD in Edinburgh University. And by the time he gets to 1955, he's joined the Foreign Service, a research facility, researching um, various oils, various nut-based oils, and written lots of papers. And by 1963, he was the first person to be awarded an MBE, and he got this for writing a dictionary in the Mandingo language. So he joined the Foreign Service and went to Gambia Research Facility, and so he ended up picking up the language there so well that to help his other colleagues that were coming out to this facility, he was um, rewarded by uh, you know, getting this MBE medal. So the next part of my talk is about the political firsts that have come from UK and from Glasgow. And these are two pictures. The one on the left is Uncle Bashir Man again. He's been lifted up by his colleagues on the shoulders. He was UK's first Justice of Peace in 1968, and then went on to become the first Muslim counselor in 1970. Now prior to him, the only other uh, person of South Asian heritage that was a counsellor was Dr. Janthi Das Sagar in 1936, and that was in Dundee. So, he, but he was a first Muslim counsellor. Now he was, he came in 1953 to Glasgow and he was university educated, but actually worked as a peddler. So sold items door to door, but he realized that he was heavily involved in helping the community because he was educated. So writing letters, making, you know, if he had to go and see somebody or explain so somebody, explain something to someone, he was able to speak the language. And he made history by becoming the first Muslim counsellor in the ward, um, the Kingston ward, because that was a predominantly Scottish ward. So most of the votes came from the Scottish white people. So he was heavily also involved in setting up Glasgow Central Mosque, along with many countless others, including Yaqub Ali and Uncle Shaheen, as I mentioned before. And during his time in, in, in Glasgow, every year he was involved in some kind of um, voluntary role, of, you know, position of responsibility. He was deputy chairman of the Commission for Racial Equality, deputy lieutenant of Glasgow, convener of Strathclyde Police Board, you know, president of Scottish Council of Voluntary Organisations, countless, countless others. And he was a strong advocate for Muslims to get engaged with playing their part in all aspects of civic life. And he's written three books, which um, kind of document the history of the South Asian community within Scotland. So 37 years later, we then have the first Muslim member of parliament, Mohammed Sarwa, in 1997, he gets elected. And he was the first Muslim to take oath on the Quran and before becoming an MP. 
And in fact, the Quran that he took the oath on was in our exhibition as well, which was a very old, 250 years old, one of the oldest Qurans in Scotland. And you'll recognize him as the present day governor of Punjab in Lahore. And what's really interesting actually with both of these men and these achievements is that there's a very small population of South Asians in Glasgow. So we make a thinking of something like less than 2% of the total South Asian population in, in UK. Um, but yet these political firsts are coming from Glasgow rather than, you know, you'd expect them from maybe London or from Birmingham or Manchester, other places where it's, you know, heavily South Asian um, populated. So this demonstrates that there is a very different and unique integration experience within Scotland itself. And of course, the pioneering, and of course, that, that, that can be through various things, such as the kind of work that the community was involved in, the, the, the kindness of the host community, you know, and the, the experience that they've had in Scotland itself. So it meant that they picked up language skills and social skills a lot quicker in Scotland compared with down south in, in England. So these pioneering achievements for both of these individuals has actually opened up the doors to many others in Scotland and of course in the rest of UK. And of course, I wanted to show you this picture of ladies uh, called Swaranji, also known as Sharon Burmi nowadays. She's one of the first South Asian uh, police officers in Scotland. In 1974, she became a very young cadet and we have her interview recorded as well. But what's really interesting here is that this is in 1974 and the first Scottish South Asian policewoman down south was I think 1971. So it shows that we were never that far behind. We were either ahead of the game or we were just there at the same time. So it's quite a forward thinking community within Scotland. And of course, I have her interview recorded as well in our archive. And then we have some of the females, female participation in politics. And we've got Mrs. Saro Jalal, who was the first female South Asian Justice of Peace from Edinburgh, and that was in 1986. And of course, Auntie Praganda from Glasgow, who became the first Muslim Justice of Peace in the early 1990s. And Mr. Shaheen Bufel's daughter, Baroness Nushina Mubarak becomes a member of the House of Lords in 2014. So just coming back to now, Mr. Atta Ashraf, wanted to highlight the story of Glasgow's mosques. So most South Asians came with a five-year plan. They wanted to work, save, and then eventually go back to India or to Pakistan. And yet we have people starting the first mosque. Now, Mr. Ashraf came in 1926, but he set up the constitution and set up a committee of people in 1933. And this was called Jumiyat al-Muslimin. And by the time we get to 1944, he's been raising funds along with at least another seven people who contributed a hundred pound for this mosque here. Just on the right hand side, you can see this Scotland's first mosque opens in a tenement in the Gorbals. So it's in 27 Oxford Street. And this picture itself is from a video, from video film footage from the National Library of Scotland. Anybody that wants to see that, just go to the National Library of Scotland webpage and Google up um, the word mosque and it should come up with this, the video for this. So this mosque itself, you can see at the bottom, it, this looks like flats, but this was the Indian Seaman's house. Uh, not a house, sorry, it was a club for the Indian seamen, so the people that were travelling on boats coming and going to the docks in Glasgow. First floor there was a mosque, and on the second and third floor there was residential houses that were also um, given out on rent. So that was a means of an income for the mosque as well. So this mosque was then knocked down as Gorbals became redeveloped, and we then had a second converted mosque in Carlton Place that was donated by Muhammad Tafil Shaheen. And that mosque was eventually, you know, donated. Uh, the, the sale of that mosque was donated, the money was donated towards Glasgow Central Mosque. But I just wanted to show you this little picture here of some of the things that were going on inside the mosque. There was the Quranic classes that were taking place, and it also was an Urdu school. So in 1961, 
you can see a lot of these children and the teachers in the mosque. And many of these are obviously much older now. Some of these children here on the right hand side are grandchildren of Mr. Muhammad Ashraf. And they've given interviews uh, for our archive as well. So you can see that we had the first Islamic classes and Urdu school in the Oxford Street Mosque. And there's also a black and white film again available at the National Library of Scotland that you can just, uh, if you go to the Moving Image Archive website and just type in mosque, it should be able to come up with the film as well. And you can see these children actually sitting there learning and writing in Urdu as well. So these are just some of the very few people, um, there's quite a few people that helped out with you know, fundraising for the mosque. Some of the younger members decided that the committee, the committee itself decided that the Muslim community was beginning to settle here and it was growing. So they needed to be something put in place for future foolproofing. So they put up quite a, a, you know, quite a fierce argument with the older members of the community and saying that they wanted to raise funds now to build a purpose-built mosque, not just a repurposed building. So plans were finally drawn up and sent to the council. There was a lot of chewing and throwing backwards. So this process took nearly 20, 25 years. But these are some of the men that you can see. You can see here, there's Rafiq Sher on the left. There's Uncle Tafil Shaheem, Uncle Bashir Mam. And they're, they've gone to Pakistan, they went to Saudi Arabia, they spoke to lots of people, they managed to get a lot of funding as well. And you can see uh, President Zia Haq from Pakistan, who in fact eventually donated uh, the, all the carpets in the central mosque, the, all the green carpets, I should say, they've recently been changed in the last two or three years. So he donated the original carpets. And of course, I can't. Finish, I can't do the, finish this talk until I talk about Mr. Fadeh Sharp, who is somebody that was mentioned in many of the interviews that I've done. He was a member of the Glasgow community that arrived in 1930, related to the Ashra family, and he arrived from a village called Mardarpur in India. And so many people have talked to me about him, saying that he, he would lend them money to be able to go back to Pakistan or India. He would... Um, also help, you know, with his own hands, help to repair things in people's houses or take people to hospital for appointments and, in, and also acted as a translator for the community in those days. And of course, when somebody passed away, he was the first point of call that people would get in touch with. So he was given the unique honour of digging the foundations for Glasgow Central Mosque. And there's a picture there um, from the sort of late, I would say early in the mid 1970s of him um, laying the first foundation brick. And of course, we now have the Glasgow Central Mosque itself, and that's what it looks like. So from the humble beginnings of being in a tenement in 1944, and then 40 years later, we have our own purpose-built mosque. So this is probably the largest project undertaken by both the Muslim men and women. The women did a lot of fundraising, lots of bake sales, lots of Mina bazaars, lots of door-to-door -door collecting. And I guess it really shows the sort of forward planning of our elders and really sent a, a clear message to everyone that it kind of signifies that the sort of Muslim community displaying their Muslim identity and the fact it symbolizes that Scotland is our home and that we're here and our, our children are here and they're staying here. So I think this was quite a poignant time for the Muslim community um, in the early 80s. So in conclusion, I'd just like to finish off this part of the talk by saying that these men and women are just some of the early pioneers. There are countless others, so many others, mainly came from the Punjab region and of course spoke very little English, but yet managed to um, do very well. And from this small community, there's been so many different firsts in business and politics. And it kind of shows that there's a, the integration experience is markedly positive compared with experience in England. And of course, each and every one worked very hard to contribute to Glasgow and Scotland. I'd just like to thank everyone for their attention. If you've got any questions, do put them in the chat.
Okay, so happy to take any questions. This session is um, divided in two parts. So we're taking some questions. If you have any, please do ask Shahid. And then we'll proceed with the second part. Thank you. Uh, Shahid, that was amazing. So really enjoyed it. Well done, you. <laughs> Thank you. As I'm actually reading some of the chat lines here, thank you very much for everybody who's uh, who's participating in this, and uh, thank you for uh, for many of the thank yous and uh, uh, congratulations coming in. Okay. If there are no question, we can proceed, and maybe people can ask at the end. Yeah, of course. Okay, that's fine. Just give me one second while I share my screen for the next presentation. Okay, can everyone see that? Is that okay? Okay, so the second part of my talk is about the British Indo-Pak Army and Scotland's connection with Force K6. So what I'll cover in this talk is the British Indo-Pak Army and its contribution to both the world wars. And of course, who were Force K6 and their connection with Scotland and of course, you can ask any questions in the chat box and we'll cover them later at the end. We can have a discussion later on. Okay, so this is a slide from, this is a bar graph actually that we actually had on display at the Glass Asians exhibition. And it shows India's contribution. When I say India, we're talking about Pakistan, Bangladesh, India together, this is pre-partition. So it's the contribution towards World War One and World War Two in terms of the number of service men and women, amount of money and you know how many people passed away. So you can see from this that over four million in total took part in World War I and World War II. And this is from various faiths, this is uh, including sort of Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Christians, Gurkhas and any other and people of no faith as well. And so over 161,000 in total died over both. You can see the figures separately by looking at you know by seeing them in the slides but in total, it was over 161,000 that died and 250,000 that were injured. And you can see that there's a whole range of various ethnic groups and um, faiths. But what's really interesting is, and a lot of people don't realize this, and I didn't realize until I started doing this work, was that it was actually India itself that contributed a lot of money and resource towards fighting um, to, to, for this fight you know, for, for Britain in both the wars, it wasn't the other way around. So they put in a lot of resources and a lot of money. And I've kind of just highlighted um, rough figures here. So we're talking like 479 million in those days in sort of 1914 and 1 1.3 billion by the time it gets to World War II. And then also what that means in today's money, 25 billion and 53 billion. And you can see that there's a lot of people have, have, have died, become injured. But we've also managed to get um, many of the soldiers were awarded Victoria Crosses. Now, Victoria Cross is something that is awarded for extreme valor and extreme bravery. It's not so. To give you an example, from four million people, only thirty-nine of these crosses were awarded, which is actually still a huge number. But it just goes to show you that over both the wars, there was thirty-nine in total. Now my next picture is something which I managed to find in a photo album of somebody in, in Glasgow. So I'll just go through what this picture shows. So on the, on the left hand side, we have somebody called Gyan Singh, who was captured, he captured a Japanese anti-tank gun and gifted it to Pakistan, believe it or not. And his son actually to this day still lives in Glasgow. So it was his, it was in his family album. 
So he was awarded a Victoria Cross for bravery. You can probably just about see that on his pocket there. And he was, he fought in World War II. And then he's standing next to this really um, uh, sort of very serious looking gentleman. His name was Khudadad Khan. Now he's somebody that was awarded the Victoria Cross and you can see it's on his lapel there in World War I. So both of them, there's quite an age difference. And every two years, and this was a, um, an award that was given to people, they would have to either come to Britain and they were given this award by, this, this medal by um, King George himself. And every two years after they received the medal, they would be invited back to Buckingham Palace for a reunion. So them and others that were given the Victoria Cross would be invited. So this is a picture outside Buckingham Palace in 1956. So Khudadad Khan was the first South Asian soldier ever to be awarded a Victoria Cross in World War I. And like I said, in total there was 39. So now to talk to you about the connection of Force K6 and who they were and how they're related to um, how they are um, important in Scot Scottish history. Force K6 were an all Muslim regiment from the Pakistan side of pre-partition India. And they were made up of approximately 1800 personnel and 2000 mules. And they were a mule, mule transport regiment. So that means that during, they were asked by the, the British armed forces to help support them during the, within the trenches in France. So many of them traveled by boat from 1939 to France. And this was because mechanized, um, me mechanized jeeps were unable to get to the front line. So by having these carts that were attached to mules, they were able to get them uh, goods and supplies to the front line uh, fighters and soldiers. So they came to France And from France, they were evacuated. Eventually, many of them were evacuated from Dunkirk, believe it or not, and came to Britain towards Cornwall. And when they escaped from Dunkirk, they came to Cornwall, and then from Cornwall, they came to Scotland for Operation Ju Jupiter, which was to try and um, do mountain warfare training. The Operation Jupiter was something that didn't actually go ahead, but it was for the preparation of possible invasion of Norway. So, you can see that this group of soldiers had come to France and from the four companies that were sent, three of them escaped um, and two of them from Dunkirk. One of them was captured as prisoner of war. And in fact, the ones that were captured as prisoner of war, their sergeant in charge, his son still lives in, in Scotland and he also has some information about them too. He's got a letter, he's got escape instructions, he's got testimony from his father. So there's quite a big story in there. So many of them came to Dalwini Station in Scotland, and then from there they travelled into Kunusi, and from Kunusi uh, they went to their different camps. So this is a, a really nice picture that shows it shows the soldiers in the Highlands in Aviemore in round about 1942, and you can see the kind of outfits that they've got. They've got their buggeries, they've got their um, traditional uniforms, they're sort of about, um, you can see the animals in the background as well, and you can obviously see the Scottish landscape. So this is a picture from the Imperial War Museum. So a couple of other pictures that have been sent in from people up north uh, in Ballater, you can see there's one of the soldiers with some refugee children that came from the island of Ger from Guernsey, sorry during World War II. And there's a little toy soldier that he's holding, a little toy horse, sorry, that he's holding in his hand. So very often the soldiers would be invited over to various houses to come and, you know, spend time with them because they were here for so long. They were here for nearly, for over a year. And they made very good local, local friends, local connections. This is another picture of soldiers in Golfby, which is further up from Inverness. And you can see this is in King George the, the Fifth Park. I think Duke of Sutherland is inspecting them all. So there's quite a few of them here. And this is a picture of them in Laird with their animals. So they came to Scotland. There was about 1,800 of them. 
just about 1,700 of them at the time. And they were, they were stationed in various areas all around Scotland, not just in one place. So they made quite a big impact up north and it's quite a highly un, sort of unsuspecting um, location you would imagine for the Highlands to have this. But of course, many of them, um, many of them obviously survived and went back, eventually were returned back to um, India before partition. But some of them unfortunately passed away and we know that 13 of them died in Scotland and nine of them are actually buried within Kinusi Cemetery. So this is an image of Kinusi Cemetery on a very nice day. You can see the front two rows and then one of the graves is on the third row just there where I'm circling. So they've got nine soldiers that are buried there. The rest of them were sent back about 1944. So they died from various reasons such as you know, um, various illnesses or various accidents. In fact, one of them passed away on one of the hills here whilst during training in the Glen Feshi Hills. Uh, he wasn't appropriately dressed, so he was left behind during a training exercise. And when the team went back to see him the following day, in, in daylight hours, he was no longer. So this is somewhere where we take, uh, we hold our Can You See Remembrance service every year. We have a lady called Isabel Harling that looks after these graves. I'll show you a picture of her later and also a video of her too. So that her family, and she's been looking after the graves of these soldiers for over 70 years. She's given that kind of commitment to be looking after them. And nowadays they're looked after by the Commonwealth Graves Commission. And you can see she's, she's tended to these plants. She's planted them. She's looked after this kind of area. And it's only these front two rows and the third row where the grave is that that's the case. The rest of the graves don't have anything like this. So she's really looked after them. There's a nice picture of Isabel. Last year, she was awarded the British Empire Medal. She lives in Canusi. She's about 99 now, I think, 98 or 99 years old. And She's been really looking after the, the, the graves and, you know, she talks to these soldiers very fondly and calls them her boys. And her reason for it is, she says, they came over here from home and gave their lives for us. So it's only right that we should remember them. So I think, Steve, if you're okay, we can show this, show the video then for, can you see, for um, Isabel Harlan, please? Isabel Harling, she's a very special person. We're so privileged that she could come along with her family. She's at 95, if, I, if I'm correct, and she's a member of the British Legion in Scotland. She's certainly a member of the British Legion who fulfills the motto that they have, which is service before self. And she has tended to the graves of these nine young men buried in Kinusi Cemetery in Force K6 for over 60 years. <laughs> Their families were far away and they were far from home. And I didn't want the families at home to think their boys were forgotten because my brother is buried in Belgium and the people of Belgium look after his grief. It's only right that somebody around here should look after the Indian boys. Because you have given them all service to, you know, to, to these lads. So this is for Thank you. you so <laughs> <laughs> I never thought this day would, I never even dreamt this day would happen because I don't need thank you. I was happy to do it for the boys. Far from home. It's marvellous that all the lads down at the cemetery are remembered officially as well as privately and to let the family know that they're not forgotten. Okay, what an amazing story then for Isabel Harling, such a selfless, caring 
amazing woman. I mean, even just to think about her gives me the chills. And I've met her several times uh, during our remembrance service that we have every year in Kinsey. And her family are just amazing as well. They, 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 she's now given that responsibility to her granddaughter to look after the graves. And in fact, um, there is a podcast. If you go to the Colourful Heritage website and under our resources section, you'll see a podcast for Force K6. And you'll be able to uh, listen to a lot more stories, including her, daughter, um, her granddaughter and the kind of person that Isabel has always been. She's been a very kind, loving, caring person. But, you know, as a, as, as a single mum, she brought up her family. She worked in the Wrens. Um, she, she was involved in a lot of work on a motorbike. So she would be passing messages, you know, during World War II, and she would have to keep her lights down and drive around the Highlands. So she's quite um, an amazing, exceptional person very kind, very generous, very loving, and to look after graves of people that she, she, she doesn't know, you know, I'm not even sure that she even met any of the soldiers, but she took this upon herself, and she did this very quietly, very humbly for the last 70 years, and every year she still goes and pays her respects, you know, she lays a wreath down, she puts down her poppy, and she looks after the area, you know, and her family's involved in this as well, so truly amazing women. So what I wanted to highlight next was that, um, I know Duncan's touched upon this, but again, on our website, if you go to the school section, you'll find that these we've got these amazing resources, this digital schools resource pack. And the story of Force K6 is within unit two. And there's a little bit more information about Isabel Harling. And we had actually a group of children that, you know, very lovingly wrote a letter to her that I did pass on. So it was a whole class of children that wanted to thank her. So that was one of the activities that they took up on and they thanked her for her kindness, for her warm um, caring nature and looking after these soldiers. So there's a whole load of these booklets um, and I've shown many of the pictures already within the talk. So if any teachers or any educationalists are out there and they'd like to have a look, just download them for free and you can get in touch with me and the website and um, through the website as well on, by email. So bearing in mind that, you know, we have this connection with the British Indo-Pak Army, there isn't actually, Scotland itself doesn't have a single memorial to commemorate the sacrifice of these soldiers, these sort of servicemen and women during both the world wars. So Colourful Heritage and Partners are looking to build Scotland's first memorial to commemorate all the different, you know, the different faith groups, the different ethnicities uh, that fought so bravely for Britain during uh, World War One and Two. So this permanent memorial in Glasgow will help to serve as a reminder for our future generations, for our younger children, to help them to remember the contribution and sacrifice that our forefathers, that these forgotten South Asian soldiers, in fact, um, have made. So it shows children from different backgrounds and face that they too have a stake in this country. And of course, that we have a shared history, we have a joint history. South Asian history is British history. They both go hand in hand. So what we did was we've got three parameters that we wanted a memorial to represent. So the first one is diversity. We want it to be inclusive. We want it to include everybody, all the different faiths. We also want it to represent a special link. So we want that link between Scotland and Porsche K6 want that to be shown and we also want to um, we, we, we want to thank Isabel Harling by by highlighting her selfless commitment you know and the sort of respect and selfless commitment that she has that's you know she just epitomizes that especially looking after these graves so what these kind of three elements to be really as a focal point as a center point for our memorial so what we've done last year Oops, sorry. We actually wrote out to a few schools to try and get them involved in the project. So to educate them about the British Indian Army, they downloaded our booklets and then we had talks arranged for them. And we asked them to we asked children to design what they thought a memorial should look like with these three parameters in mind. And we got back nearly 105 entries from a variety of children 
you know, from primary school to high school ages to youth groups. And you can just see that's just a, a, a really small sample of the kind of designs that came back to us of what they learned. So this was something we could have done on our own. We could have just, Colourful Heritage could have just by themselves taken this and decided, right, we're going to build this memorial and that's it. But we wanted the community to get involved. We had a social media campaign. We asked various faith groups and we asked children, we asked the youth. So what we've done now is we managed to narrow down and really pick out the various elements from the different designs that the children had sent and come up with one kind of um, one, ma one main design. And that covers pretty much everything that has been asked of us from the various faith groups. And we've now given that design in for, um, for towards planning permission to the architect. So to find out more about our memorial, if you go to our web page and click on the BIA memorial section, there's a lot of detail in there. There's a lot of videos, there's a lot of articles. You can see some of the other pictures as well that children have sent in and you can keep up to date on our social medias as well. So one of the locations that we are considering or that we've been given um, as a proposed site is Kelvin Grove Art Galleries. You can see this grand building here in red sandstone. And this in fact is the home of one of the pictures by Henry Lamb of uh, driver Abdul Ghani, who's one of the drivers for Force K6. So it has a strong connection with Force K6 already. So in the grounds of it, just to the left here in the front, there's, there's an area here that we've kind of got earmarked for this memorial that we're looking to build. So I'd like to take the opportunity now just to thank everyone for, for listening and for um, listening to the talk and seeing the, the slides. And of course, these are our, this is our email address. If you write into this, I'll be able to pick that up. You can see more on our website as well and you know, follow us on social media. So I hope you've enjoyed this talk and you've learned you know, some really interesting sort of nuggets of information about Scotland and our link to um, heritage within, within the South Asian community. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much. It, uh, you know, we are still taking questions, Queen Aid, and uh, you know, we, we, we will respond to as many as we can. Uh, but all that uh, remains now um, is uh, for me to uh, do the closing remarks. So uh, uh, in closing, I would, uh, I would like to thank our chief guest, Duncan Dorn from Glasgow Museums. Uh, of course, my colleague, Saki Brazak and uh, Kesha Shiraz and the team at MacFest uh, you know, for this informative and uh, eye-opening historical accounts the sacrifices and contributions of uh, Muslims and indeed, um, you know, the South Asians from all, uh, uh, you know, from all walks of life, from uh, all castes and creed to Scotland, uh, their sacrifices, their hopes, their aspirations have truly made this country colourful in its culture and rich in its diversity. And we are forever uh, immensely grateful. So finally, on behalf of uh, Duncan Sakib and all the Colour Heritage team, uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, the MacFest team, Kesra, uh, and uh, for this inspiring platform and wish MacFest 2022 all the success now and in the future. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Shahid, for wonderful wishes and for amazing hosting yourself. And Sakib, what can I say? What a lovely way to present it. And the work you're doing is absolutely amazing incredible i've learned so much and it's been very poignant watching those videos again especially about this wonderful lady isabel so we will post this recording on our macfest uh, youtube channel so people can watch it in their own time just a reminder we have two amazing panels again first thing in the morning 12 o'clock we've got this wonderful lady from the British Museum and what a feast she's going to offer you. I was over the moon when I saw some of the slides. So please join us for that. And then at in the afternoon after three o'clock, we have Islamophobia with amazing international panelists from USA, from Germany, from here, and you will enjoy it. So please uh, do book if you haven't. 
If you know us, we will provide you the link. And thank you so much for giving us your time. I know you're in Jakarta. I know you're in New York. I know you're in Scotland. I know you're in Yorkshire. You're everywhere. So thank you for all of us for giving us your wonderful Saturday. And thank you to our amazing presenter. And thank you, Duncan, for also being our chief guest for this event. Many thanks again. Goodbye. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you.